Welcome again to Sandy Hook United Methodist Church um, and our live streaming online worship. And we hope you are just blessed by this morning uh, as we worship the Lord together in our various places. Um, uh, it reminds me of uh, the first church. Um, in, when the church was born after the season of, or after the day of Pentecost and as it um, grew throughout the known world, um, Christians did not necessarily congregate in a, a one, one place, in one large facility, but rather they were in home churches and uh, they met in, in smaller places in, in individual homes or individual smaller meeting sites. And uh, I was reminded this week of how many of our scriptures are letters written by the apostles. And in some way, this is a, a new way of communicating like they did with letters as we send out the message of Christ via the internet. So we hope you're blessed. We hope you join us in singing and, uh, and in worship. And uh, as we move into a time of prayer and scripture, and that God will just bless you in your place today. Stand in worship. No, really, I'm really excited to say that to you guys. I can't wait for you guys to be back in person, but I, I, there is something special about doing this, and I love it, and I hope that you guys can find the the place to, to truly worship this morning. Amen. To the King of glory and light, all praises to the only giver of life, a maker. The gates are open wide, we worship you. Come see what love has done, a maker. He bought us with his blood, our Savior. The cross is overcome, we worship you. Shout, Hosanna, Jesus he saved. Shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave. Come and lift him up, Hosanna. be found, forgiven, death could not hold him down, he's risen, so let the saints cry out, we worship you, shout, Hosanna, Jesus he saved, shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave, come Hosanna, shout, Hosanna, Jesus, he said, shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave, come and lift him up, Hosanna. Same power that rolled the stone away, same power alive. Jesus, he said, shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave, come and lift him up, Hosanna, come and lift him up, Hosanna.
uh, worship has many dimensions. It has many actions. Um, there's a lot said. Sometimes there's nothing said. Worship comes in all forms, and we need to live our lives of worship. Uh, our motto here is devoting to God, developing one another, and demonstrating Christ's love. Worship is a time we can do all of those. One of the actions of worship that we participate in is giving of our financial gifts to the Lord. It was Jesus who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so um, we want to reflect what's in our heart by being disciples who give, by being um, believers who lay our resources at the foot of the cross and allow Jesus uh, and the work of the Holy Spirit to determine where, uh, their best use. So we want to invite you to be uh, disciples who are also givers. We want to invite you to give to the Lord in this, in this context through the church, through um, uh, the church universal and the Sandy Hook congregation. If you want to put your gift in the mail and mail it, that would be great. We also um, have an opportunity for you to just come by the church. We have a mail slot that you can just put your gift in and it drops down into a box where the mail is kept or you can call the church office and you can um, uh, ask for the procedure on how to be an online giver. I do know that when you set that up, you can do it uh, two ways. Uh, one, you can have an automatic, just it, it continues to happen, or you can set it up so that you have to go in and give every month. Um, just I ask you to pray how God might be leading you to do that, because it truly is an act of worship um, in our daily lives. Um, so let's pray. God of grace and God of love, Holy Spirit, give us discernment how you would uh, lead us to be giving followers of Jesus. Lord, help us to be good stewards of the gifts you've given us. And Lord, bless each gift and those who give them, that they might be uh, for, the, for um, fulfilling your will and your purpose. And most importantly, Lord, that they would be used to spreading the good news of Jesus Christ in the Columbus community, in our county, state, our country, and in our world. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody together in agreement says, Amen. Hey, kids, if you'll come forward real quick, come, come in close. I'm going to come a little closer. Hopefully you can see me, and it's not way over my head. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about your behavior. I know you don't want to hear it, maybe. Have you ever told somebody something, but then your behavior said something different? Like, if you have a brother or a sister or a cousin or a friend, somebody your age, maybe a little older, maybe a little younger, and, and you say things like, I love you, but then you do something mean to them? Or how about mom and dad? You tell mom and dad or your guardian or your grandparents or whoever it is that you live with, you say, I love you, and then you might argue with them. You might do things that they have told you are are wrong, you might disobey them, do your, do you, does your behavior, the way you act, does it, does it match your words? Well, one of the things that Jesus teaches us or tells us, and I'm going to talk more about it with the adults later, is that he, he, he instructs us to go teach everybody everything he commanded them. Now, to, I'm sorry, teach, teach everybody to obey everything he commanded. Now, it's one thing to teach them the commandments. You've probably been in Bible, Bible school or uh, Sunday school or mom and dad at home have taught you about the Ten Commandments and other commandments, other things that we say you know, that, that are in the Bible that we say we need to follow. It's one thing to teach what those are. It's another thing to teach people how to obey. You see, they watch if we obey those things, they watch if our actions match what we say. You know, one of the commandments 
says, honor your father and mother. Do you do that? Do people see you honor mom and dad by behaving and talking with love towards them? Or do you not honor them by disobeying? You see, we're supposed to not just teach with our words, but with our actions. And we can teach people to obey or their commandments, but we can teach them um, also how to obey. So let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us with that. Okay? Holy Spirit, just as you came on Pentecost, just as you gave birth to your universal church, we pray, God, that you would bless us um, with your presence and your spirit to give us strength, to give us uh, power, to just live out what you teach us so that we can help others see what it means to obey Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. absence of being able to gather and build off of each other, that right now you can just fill that void for us and just allow us to be emptied of the world and just filled with your presence. Amen. Is the opportunity as the gathered community to come before the Lord <clears throat> It uh, certainly is, in, in terms of our psychological power, better for us to all be present in the same place for that. But we all know that the Holy Spirit is not limited by physical space, the same physical location. 
Jesus says where two or more are gathered together, he's present with them. He says it in the context of correcting one another, um, but it certainly applies to even broader context of just being present with others in our homes or even, even being spiritually present. We may be home alone, but we're joining together for the same purpose via the Internet. And we do come and ask God to empty us in times like this. In our prayer time, we want to we wanna just allow him to fill us up. Maybe you have a prayer concern, and if you want to type it in either Facebook or Zoom, you can, and, and we'll pray over them. Or if you want to just, if you have a, a private prayer request, something anonymous that you don't want to share, you can certainly email me this week at steve.austin at... Um, sandyhook.org, all lowercase. That's steve.austin at sandyhook.org, again, all lowercase. I will receive that, and I will certainly be, keep that request in my prayer. We're going to, as we pray at the end of the prayer, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And it's a prayer in which we get in touch with um, other believers we join together in that common prayer. Again, just symbolizing we're all in this together. Following that, we're going to sing a hymn, Forward Through the Ages. It's a familiar tune if the words are not. And it, and it really is a charge for us as Christians to live out the faith that we have. And so I'll also include in the prayer time uh, a request that the Holy Spirit help us do that. So let's, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for all of the riches of heaven, the joy of salvation, the grace of eternal life, the love that leads to forgiveness. God, you have brought wholeness to our brokenness, healing to our unhealthiness, strength for our weakness, love in the midst of our anger, fellowship in the midst of isolation. For all of this, Lord, we are thankful. Lord, all of those things that are barriers are broken down because Jesus, you died on the cross that we might have our account balance. Actually, you pay the penalty for our sin. And then you rose from the dead so that even death has no more power. And so all the other things that we give power to, to cause us to stumble, to cause us to be separated from you, Lord, we... We don't need to give power to. So, Lord, give your healing, your help, and your hope. Give your strength in difficult times, your comfort as we grieve. Let your Holy Spirit console us in this very difficult time. Lord, as we're coming out of the, the isolation that was caused by the pandemic, we pray, God, you put a, you rain that virus in, Lord, and you bring healing to those who are still sick, comfort those who've lost loved ones. And Lord, as we come out of that time, we're moving into a very critical time. Our cities are erupting. There's demonstrations, and yet there's also rioting and looting, and there's um, there's there's uh, arguments and and insults flying around, Lord. There's there's anger, real anger. We pray, God, that you would help us to be a society that is inclusive of all people, and that we treat no one as though they are not worthy. For we know that in you, all of us are worthy. That we not look at life as though it's something that is is. Is, is worthless. And that God, for those of us who have responsibility in 
the community. Help us to, to view the entire community as worthy as, of our, our, our help and protection. Lord, for those of us who are angry right now, help us to not act in anger, to not blanket all, every group with, with epithets and with, with, with uh, uh, preconceived notions of what they are, but to listen and to love one another even when we disagree. Lord, help the church especially bring together the different factions of society so that we can see your peace that can transcend all understanding. Help us to truly move forward through the ages as we, we move forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ that is stronger than anything that man can devise. And we pray this in the name of Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 28. It's a familiar passage. I'm sure many of you have 
heard many sermons on this. Um, I, I decided as I began the week um, doing a little bit more earnest sermon prep uh, on this, I decided that I would not let myself get caught in the trap of uh, trying to figure out something new to say, but rather to just be open to the fact that I might, have, might remind you of some things you have already heard. This passage of Scripture is entitled, The Great Commission. And um, it is where Jesus, these are Jesus' final words to his disciples in the book of Matthew. And uh, our, our previous and now late bishop, Bishop Coiner, I heard him preach one time on this passage. And he said, you know, when you think about the, you know, people giving their last words, um, usually when people give their last words, this is pretty important. And so I think about this when I think about uh, this passage of Scripture. These are Jesus' last words in the book of Matthew. So they must be pretty important. Here now, Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Pray, would you pray with me, please? God, uh, as we have opened the Scripture, just uh, let the living Word, Jesus, become alive again and anew and afresh to us as we live out to, as we live to be um, Jesus followers and uh, the people who are called into being in Jesus' name. Speak to us once more the good news of Christ, in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. So my main idea today is this, is as, fo- as people who follow the resurrected Jesus... We now um, go and teach others how to follow him. So as we, we, we follow the resurrected Jesus, and we go now and teach people how to follow him as well. All right? So there are some things I see in this passage that both um, the circumstance teaches us and Jesus' words teach us. Okay? So let's, let's get into that. All right? I always wonder why certain things are included in the Scripture or in a particular passage. Sometimes things that just kind of stand out. Now, I, I'm, I'm an educated individual. I've, I've got the, all of the degrees that are required to, become a, a, to be an elder in the United Methodist Church. I've got the, the bachelor's degree from a college. I've got the master's degree from seminary, um, and I'm done uh, because I'm done, and I, oh, by the way, I'm done. Um, I, I've got all the education that I feel like I need. However, and, and in that education, I, I know that my, my education has told me that some things are in the Scripture because they were added after the originals. We have very few what we think original manuscripts of the, the New Testament. They they don't believe there's any, there are no original manuscripts of the Old Testament, the oldest versions of that. Um, we do know about the, um, the scrolls that were found uh, in the Qumran community, but, you know, we, we just, we don't have some of that. And what, what parts do exist, the some that do exist, you, you can see that, uh, just imagine this, paper had to be me be made, and uh, you know they were they were on papyrus, and 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 they had to that that had to be made and painstakingly, and so there wasn't a lot of it around, and so oftentimes when somebody would transcribe a, a passage, a, 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 in other words, copy one you know original, they might add an editorial note to save space. You know how we've got lines, right? And if I know, and if you're if you're in um, China or someplace, they go. No, I know Israel. They go this way because they read right to left. But we've got lines, 
Well, the same is true for the ancient manuscripts, but in between those lines, these editors would add their own teaching notes, if you will, all right? And so then the next person that copied would then include the teaching notes in the passage as if it was there from the beginning. I know all that to be true. However, I also believe that those kind of things stay in part by the Holy Spirit. I bring all that to say this. Something jumps off at me when I read this. In verse 17, we hear that, you know, we hear that the, the disciples were obedient. By the way, I, I do want to just touch on this for briefly. Just like I said last week, when you're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit and the gifts that were given, it starts with understanding Jesus as Lord. Jesus told his disciples to go to the mountain, and they, they did just as they were instructed. We're going to hold, hold on to that for a second. But they went just as they were instructed. And in 17, we find out that they, they worshipped him. But and here's the part that sticks out to me. But some doubted. Why is that there? Why is it important for those few words to be in the passage of Scripture, but some doubted? Well, here's what I think. I think it was important for, um, for, the, for the Lord, and, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, inspiring the writing and inspiring the canonization, that is, uh, you know, deciding the authoritative Scriptures for us. Um, it, it was important that we get this message, and it, it's my first observation, and that is on the outline that you were sent out. It's this. We need to just faith it. We need to just faith it. F-A-I-T-H, not F-A-C-E. We need to faith it. Just faith it. You know, you hear the phrase, just face it. We tell people, this is reality. You've got to face it. You just got to live it. You just got to deal with it. Right? And, and I'm cool with that. And oftentimes it's said in the context, it's said in a negative context. Something bad's happening, and we say, just face it, right? I don't think that's necessarily true here. What I, what, I want you to, what I think we need to understand is faith is not absence of doubt. Faith is acting in the face of that doubt. We, uh, we are experienced yesterday was the 76th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. Um, not a peaceful time in this country and in this world. Not a peaceful time in the world even today. There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of bad. There's a lot of, there's a lot of really heavy stuff going on. And, and it seems like we haven't learned our lessons yet. We still, we still resent different ethnic groups. We still have um, hatred for some. We still have, we still have anger that's unbridled and we destroy other people's livelihoods because we feel we've been destroyed. There's a lot of reason to doubt. But there are those few people who act in spite of that doubt. There are those people who, who go in to where uh, angels fear to tread because they, they believe in a principle that is so important that they act on it, even even when they have doubt. I once heard a soldier describe to me that, that, um, that bravery is not absence of fear. It's acting in the face of that fear. I, I think the same is true for, for, for faith. It's not the absence of doubt. It's acting in the face of doubt. We have to believe. We have to have faith that as bad as things look, there is something better as we continue to look at all the institutions that have failed us, all the organizations that have failed us, all the people that have failed us, we have to believe that there's something better, that, that Jesus is still at work, that Jesus is still calling us, that Jesus is still in control. Just faith it. Why? Why? Because this is, and this is my next observation, this is imperative to Jesus. That word go, typically we've we've used that that phrase. Recently, many scholars have seen that word and understand it in the context of its original meaning. And and, and it's become more of an understanding of as you go. How how many of you do to-do lists? 
I have tried and tried and tried again. We have one hand here of a to-do list. I have tried and tried and tried to do to-do lists, and sometimes I do them. Most of the time, I do them out of desperation because uh, I can't. I get to the point I can't see the forest for the trees. But as you can imagine, uh, in the Austin household right now, as um, you know, we've recently put our house up for sale, and we're packing boxes, and we're doing this and that and that and this and all this stuff. And um, I'm not a I'm not a linear thinker. I'm a I'm not really a circular thinker either. I'm more of a spiral, or I'm more of a this thing. I married a linear thinker. Now, you might think as a linear thinker, she sticks with one thing and just moves on. That's not really true. She can do like four things at once. So it's kind of been an, an interesting time in her house. But I did learn this after 30 plus years of marriage and now on my, I think we counted up ninth move in ministry over almost 30 years. Um, we, uh, I, I've learned that I, I kind of early in the morning say, okay, what do you want to get done? What do you want to get done? So that I have an understanding of what it is that, that we're going to do today. You know? And most of the things, um, there are, when she says we are going to do, most of them are we-we together. A few are she-we, she's going to do. It seems like a lot of them are he-we. Things I'm going to do. But she likes to let us know what that is. She does have a tendency sometimes to uh, add things as you go. Our boys have called her on that several times. But that's beside the point. But she's got a to-do list. And, And she keeps those things in mind. She doesn't write them down. She keeps those things in mind as she goes throughout the day. But these are things that have to get done. This is what Jesus is saying here. This is imperative to Jesus. He says, as you go, but this is imperative. Remember, there's things you have to do. As a follower of Jesus, as you go through your daily life, there's something that you need to keep in mind that is extremely important for you to do. It's imperative to Jesus. It's number one on his to-do list. It's the most important thing that as followers of Jesus, we need to remember to do. It's imperative, right? It's an imperative for Jesus. It's actually the tense of the verb there. Go, as you go. Remember this, he's saying. And he says, go into all the world. Let me get to it. Actually, let me do the the bigger print. He says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. I, I skipped a point. He, he reminds them that the authority, the power that he has that they have comes from him. He was given the authority. He's now giving it to them. And he's saying, this is important as you go. um, Make disciples of all nations. Okay? This is important. It's valuable. It's imperative. And he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know many of us come from different places theologically. Um, we, as United Methodists, come from a uh, what we call a, a Arminian position or, or theology, an understanding of God in a certain way that we're not necessarily puppets on a string and we have free will and God uses good and bad things and that um, we're not as rigid as to what has to happen to be believers. And if you remember Jesus' death, one of the records of his death on the cross He's, he's being nailed there by two thieves, and one's mocking him, and the other's telling him to be quiet. And he asks Jesus, he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. I know there are those of us who, who believe that baptism is salvific in the point that um, if you're not baptized, you don't go to heaven. And uh, that's not where we are theologically as Methodists, and it's certainly not where I'm at personally. Um, I do think baptism is important, though. And I think it's, an, it is, it's important in the life of an infant, just as it's important in the life of an adult who has yet to be baptized. All that, set that aside for a minute. The word in the Greek here means to be immersed. Okay? 
And, and, and I believe Jesus is saying, not just go through this ritual of baptism, I believe Jesus is saying is, immerse people in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. An understanding of the Trinitarian God. That's why the, Apostle Creed, the Apostles' Creed, I think, is so important. It's, it's, the, it's the church's foundational teachings of, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are to immerse people in that. We're to immerse people in an environment in which Jesus Christ is revealed, in which God the Father who created us is revealed, that the Holy Spirit who sustains us is revealed. Immerse people in God. And sometimes we have to use words. As St. Francis of Assisi would remind us. We need to immerse people in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every part of who he is. We need to immerse them. They need to, they need to see him at work in their lives. They need to see Jesus at work. We have to know what that means. We have to know him intimately. So he says, baptize them. And teaching them to obey. I always, I always, I, I, I recently in a few last few years have seen this that differently. You know, when I when I grew up and when I've heard sermons and I've heard some colleagues preach, we we get focused on teaching the commandments. A good idea. I told that to the kids. And just as I was telling the kids, I want to say here, and this is my next observation, and that is that that actions have impact. That we don't just teach the rules, if you will. In fact, we know that, that New Testament, as New Testament believers, it's not about following a set of rules, it's about following a Savior. It's not about following rules, it's about following a ruler, the one who rules over us. And, 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 and we, we do that by teaching people how to obey I heard uh, once said from a preacher that that most lessons are or or most teaching is more caught than taught. Most lessons are more caught than taught. That is to say that people will see your actions, and that will impact them more than your words. In fact, it will impact them even more if they don't match your words. And how many of us have heard it said of, of Christians that don't act very loving or Christ-like? I'll never forget my wife and I had an eye-opening experience. Uh, several years ago, we were at a restaurant that was uh, run by a parishioner. He owned it. And several of the other younger parishioners were uh, 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 service staff there. His son was one of the managers of it. And I remember one Sunday we were in there and I started talking to one of the service staff who, was a, who attended the church and several others came to join us. And, it, and at one point my wife and I were sitting in a booth and we had about oh, four service staff folks around us. And I just began to pick their brain. And I, I, was, I was shocked to learn that none of them, and usually no service staff, likes to work Sunday noontime. I'm like, why? And I was really embarrassed to learn because Christians are the worst customers ever. They always complain. They're never happy. They're the worst tippers. And I was embarrassed. Because I would think that our actions should have such an impact that wouldn't it be great if worldwide, in, in, in Columbus, in Bartholomew County, in the state of Indiana, in the, state, in the, in the United States, if if people who were service staff were fighting over the opportunities to work the, the, the lunch time on a Sunday afternoon, that people would want to work that because they know when the Christians come in, they're going to be treated with respect. They're going to be treated with, with uh, humanely. They're going to be given good tips. What does that say about us? You see, Jesus is saying, 
don't just teach them what I tell you. Don't just, don't just memorize certain words and tell them this is what they have to do. Rather, teach them how to do it. Teach them how to obey. Let your actions speak. Actions have impact. And the last thing, maybe my favorite part of this passage, those last few words, the last of his last words. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Last point, hold on to the promise. Hold on to the promise. Have faith in the fact that no matter what, He's with you. Hold on to the promise. I, uh, I guess this kind of leads me back to my first point. I told you I don't think, um, I don't think in a linear, I think uh, more spiral, circular. You know, we can get caught in the trap of, you guys can go on up. Come on up. You can get caught in the trap of, of believing that things are too bad, too difficult. Life, life is, is in turmoil. Right now, we can see the news and see what's happening. And, and, and our minds, our hearts, our, our emotions can be all over the place. If we dare to speak on one event, somebody else is going to accuse us of something, and so we we don't hold, we we keep our mouth quiet. Or when we say something, we don't say it with love, and and we don't say it with um, a full understanding of the events. We look to we look to other institutions, other organizations to fix it. And, and it seems like somehow they either make it worse or have no impact at all. We have to have faith that Jesus is walking with us through all of this. And sometimes he's not going to shake us into being alert, but rather he's going to whisper in our ear, And he's going to inspire us and he's going to encourage us to live it out in such a way people see Jesus in us. We faith it because we know he's with us. One of, if if not the favorite scripture that I have, at least one of them, is Hebrews 11.1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It's easy to look at the world and say we don't see Jesus because in some ways we don't. Unfortunately, where we need to see Jesus in the life of Christ followers, we don't often see it. Today, we can change that. It is imperative that we go with the authority of Christ into the world, and we immerse them in the full reality of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and let our actions speak even louder than our words so that they can catch the lesson. And remember, He's with us. You know, maybe you don't feel like He's with you now. Maybe you feel like you are separated, and maybe you are going, Steve, I, I, I just need to get through the next day or this next moment. He is with you. If you, fe- if you feel separated from God, who moved, him or you? He's with you. And all he's asking is you just Open yourself up. Let him in. Give him control. And as a follower of Jesus, go tell others. Go share.
show others Jesus. Amen. I'm going to pray in a minute. If you've never let Jesus in, I want to invite you to do that. If you've been a believer, you've struggled being a follower, and you feel distant from him, I want to invite you to do that as well. Just pray as I do. And let this be the beginning of of now going with Christ in your everyday life. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask that as we go, that you would help us to know that you go with us. We don't have to feel it. We don't have to. We don't have to have signs. We don't have to have wonders. Lord, we just... We just need the strength to act in the face of doubt. And Lord, we know we we just call out to you saying we need you. Lord, for the one who has been hearing these messages, for the one who tuned in today, either recommended by someone or just happened to come across this service, we just pray, God, that if your Holy Spirit has touched them and and they've never had Jesus as Lord, if they've never believed in Him in such a way that they've allowed Him into their lives to take away the, the circumstances and the consequences of sin, Lord, I pray that You move into their lives and not only take away the consequences, but give them power over sin. God, change them in such radical ways that people will see Jesus in you, Lord, in them. And that they will move with uh, the, the, the environment of the work of the Holy Spirit as people experience the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in their lives. Lord, for all of us, draw us close to you, not for our own benefit, but rather so that we have an intimate knowledge of you so we can go share you with the world. Let our, let our behavior, let the things we say and do, to honor and glorify Christ that people can't help but want to know Him as we do. Lord, may none of this be to our glory but to Yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Steve said, uh, caught, not taught. And uh, the words of this song say, there's nothing better than you. We're going to see sing graves in the garden and if that's true today in your life, there's nothing better than Jesus, um, then our actions should be caught regardless of what happens in your life. If Jesus is the ultimate good in your life, then whatever happens shouldn't change that. And I just pray that as we sing this song, you, you can move forward after singing this song, living for God and, and shining that light for others. You must. 
mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you know. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better. time coming when we're not going to have to do this like this we can be in the same facility I will tell you that the congregation or the, the leadership here is making plans to continue an online presence um, but our first Sunday back your first Sunday back I should say will be July 5th as you uh, <clears throat> welcome your your new uh, pastoral leadership your pastor leader uh, pastor Paul Desay. Um, and I believe that uh, our, uh, our current conference superintendent, who will be officially an, a, an assistant conference superintendent at the time, will be here maybe to speak and to introduce him. Um, but that is, that is, uh, um, that, that is a, the nature of the church, to gather together uh, to worship even when they're separate from one another. It is my hope that you will continue today in the power of the Holy Spirit 